Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nilo Shuja and you're watching Rise and Shine with Barry University. Today's discussion is with someone who has been the ambassador to Poland and Cambodia, who has been the Deputy High Commissioner of Papua New Guinea. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the honorable presence of Her Excellency, Ms. Margaret Adamson, who is the High Commissioner of Australia in Pakistan. It is a delight to be sitting here with such an esteemed and eminent diplomat. In today's discussion, we're going to be covering a few areas from her reasons to why she joined the public affairs um, organization uh, to her experience abroad and in Pakistan, as well as what it takes to be a true diplomat. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Her Excellency, Ms. Margaret Adamson. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Berry University. It's an honor to have you here. Wa alaikum salam. It's a delight to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, let me just start by saying that it's a great privilege to be in the same room as a strong, uh, prominent and very um, confident woman such as yourself. It gives a lot of um, us Pakistanis and in general females all over the world to be to have role models like you. So my first question is, what what was the motivation that you had to come into the public uh, affairs um, organization? Okay. Well, I guess uh, public affairs organization that can encompass uh, any form of public service, you know, whether you are joining the police force, uh, yes. whether you're going to take the path uh, into the judiciary, uh, whether you're going to be a doctor. I mean, serving the public yeah. uh, is a very powerful motivation, I think, uh, for young people everywhere. Yeah. And uh, that certainly was my motivation for going into the service, so to speak. And then it was a case of, well, what, what part of the service, what would I actually like to do in the service of my population, my people, my nation? Yeah. And uh, so um, it, it quickly leapt from being a uh, service within Australia on behalf of my, uh, my nation in a domestic sense to service of my nation uh, for its, uh, its own interests abroad. And, uh, and so that uh, very quickly became in those years. These days you have a very broad array of opportunities to, to travel and serve your nation abroad. But traditionally it is, uh, it is the, the foreign affairs, uh, foreign ministry, the, the diplomatic path. Yeah. And, uh, and so that is what I, I chose to do. What was the motivation for you to become a diplomat? to do actually go into that particular path. Well, as I said, it, um, it, it, it grew from my desire to serve my nation. And I think that if you are thinking in terms of uh, any nation's um, um, success, in terms of its um, economic development, in terms of its um, uh, interaction internationally, uh, you, you need a strong cadre of, uh, of diplomats, basically. It's, it is um, often cited as being one of the very, very oldest professions. So going all the way back to centuries before certainly the term globalization was ever thought about, you needed envoys. They're often yeah. called plenipotentiary representatives. They would travel to, to other parts of the world to um, introduce, introduce their, um, their interest, introduce their nation, negotiate whether that was going to be on the level of, of trade or negotiate whether it was going to be uh, an agreement with a next door neighbor or with a great power in a more distant location. And these days with globalization, of course, those uh, elements have, of course, become a kaleidoscope of, of interaction uh, between nations and between peoples. And so um, I think that one finds uh, an increasing motivation on the part of uh, younger generations and perhaps you yourself <laughs> might decide uh, to aspire to go into diplomacy. I would also just like to add that curiosity is, is another uh, key, certainly in my own makeup, uh, another driver because if you, if you grow up in a, in a nation which is already quite culturally diverse, your appetite is whetted by the desire to, to experience at first hand, you know, the cultures, uh, the, the different parts of the world that your own population has been drawn from. And Australia, of course, is quintessentially uh, yeah. a, a country made up of, of, uh, of, of peoples from all over the world, in addition, of course, to our amazing indigenous peoples. So there we are, curiosity, a big motivating factor too. 
All right. So you've traveled to Poland. You were an ambassador there. You've been an ambassador to Cambodia. Mm -hmm. You were the High Commissioner in Papua New Guinea. How was that experience? I mean, traveling to new countries, learning new cultures, traditions, perspectives. How mm. was that for you? Well, I would like to say that it definitely satisfies that that curiosity streak uh, because of the sheer diversity of those of those countries. And I would also add, I have served in Vietnam as well. I've served also in in Germany and uh, and in Austria with the multilateral posting. So in all of those places, you've got a great variety of history. You've got a great variety of, uh, of, of cultural heritage and, of course, uh, different uh, landscape and, uh, and uh, different uh, 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 natural diversity as well. So all of those places uh, are inspirational for those variety of, of reasons. And uh, they've all of them. I, I actually uh, contributed a chapter to uh, a book a few years ago, which was called uh, "Women with a Mission: A Double mm. Meaning." There, you know, a mission in terms of your your career aspirations, but also it was a book written by Australian ambassadors or high commissions, so women who had actually had a mission to manage or to yeah. lead in an in a uh, in an international setting on behalf of Australia. And I noted in my chapter that I had uh, had the great privilege of and it was just ad hoc really you, you don't know that this is going to happen because history can happen any any yeah. it, it's it's happening around us all the time and I was just very privileged I think to happen to be a witness to change so when I was in Vietnam all those years ago I was really a witness hmm. to its uh, unification to its recovery from a very difficult phase. When I was yeah. in Cambodia, I was there at a, at a very pivotal time to the rebuilding of the society following the Khmer Rouge horror, yeah. the commencement of the Khmer Rouge trials of the, the leaders of the Pol Pot regime. Mm -hmm. When I was in Germany and Poland, this was the end of the Cold War. These were countries that were coming together again in the case yeah. of Germany and in the case of Poland, rediscovering democracy and joining NATO, joining the European Union, yeah. rediscovering their, uh, their, their own very strong roots of, of uh, democratic practice. So all of those uh, are, are great examples of, of witnessing change. And when it comes to Papua New Guinea, my goodness, this is a, this is a kaleidoscope country which is undergoing amazing uh, transformation. 800 and some different languages are spoken in Papua New Guinea, which of course indicates just how many different uh, tribal uh, traditions and cultures and backgrounds there are. And it's also an absolutely remarkable uh, nation in, in terms of its, um, its, its natural beauty and, uh, uh, and of course its, its uh, trajectory into uh, the, the modern era. So all of those um, pretty amazing experiences on a professional level and on a personal level. I'm very, very privileged. I, I have uh, a wonderful partner mm. in my husband and our children have come with us everywhere. Oh, so I think that uh, if, if you like, it's not been such, um, to me I would say, through my curiosity and my desire to serve my nation, um, it's not been such a challenge for me. The challenge has been for my partner and for my children. And I'm, I'm delighted to say uh, that uh, I, I believe that they have been happily um, fellow travellers along, along this journey. All right, so since you've been to so many countries, what, was, what are some aspects that were common amongst them? Okay, uh, well I said before, um, the um, momentous change that was uh, a very much a factor in each and every one of the countries that mm -hmm. I have uh, served in, that was just a total coincidence because they, uh, they each have great difference in terms of, of their, um, their historical trajectory yeah. uh, and in terms of their, uh, their cultural uh, and, uh, and, and ethnicity. Um, in, in that respect as well. So each of them very, very different. So the common feature, I guess, uh, would be their, um, their response and the challenge that they were presented with and confronted with of change. And when it comes to Indochina, which is of course uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, when it comes to uh, Germany and Poland in particular uh, in their recent pasts, um, and of course Austria also a member of the European Union, it comes to that uh, integrating uh, incentive. Are they going to um, find peace amongst domestically, them. but also amongst themselves? Yeah. And that of course is building blocks for global peace as well. 
So you were appointed as the High Commissioner in um, Pakistan in the year 2015. That's right. How was that experience? Were you excited or a, a little hesitant? What was going through your head at that time? Well, actually, I was, I was very um, enthusiastic to be posted to Pakistan. I volunteered uh, oh. to be posted to Pakistan, and I wanted very much to have an opportunity, very much, again, the motivation of uh, my other postings, and that was to go to a place where important things are happening. And uh, so in the case of, of this particular nation, look, important things are happening every day in, in, in Pakistan. It's That's a country true. which only, as, as we were observing in our earlier conversation with the other students, it's a country that's only turning 70 this year. It's in a region which is confronted by enormous challenge, but also in a region which enjoys amazing opportunity. And, and so it is that nexus of, uh, of the challenge against the opportunity and uh, you know, all of those regional dynamics uh, which are very, very complex but very, very important on a regional level, but they also engage very directly as well as indirectly yeah. Australian national interests and also globally. So I, I wanted very much to come and serve in this part of, of the world uh, and quite uh, obviously as well, given the just amazing, amazing uh, heritage of, of this part of the world, it's an utterly fascinating uh, history to become more familiar with as well and having an opportunity to live in a country is uh, utterly unique in that respect. So when you arrived here how was the cultural shock? Well I'd like to say I'm over cultural shock you know as having having traveled so extensively um, no I, I was not uh, at all confronted by cultural shock um, what I have been very delighted with is indeed to have affirmation of my expectation in, in regard to uh, what Pakistan has to offer. I've traveled as extensively over the last almost two years that I've been here. Yeah. I've traveled as extensively as I possibly can. I've, in fact, I was delighted I could take one of my children up to the northern areas oh. uh, last year. I took her also to Lahore and, and to Karachi. I've taken my son and my other daughter uh, to Lahore and uh, I've traveled uh, to uh, different parts of uh, Sindh. I've been up to KP, I, I'm going to Fatah shortly, I've been to Quetta, uh, I've been uh, in, in many, many parts of, uh, of Pakistan. And so it's the, it's the different, um, uh, different regions of, of the nation, but also once again that kaleidoscope of, of uh, historical uh, 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 ingenuity that one sees in the built heritage yeah. but I mean you are wearing some mm -hmm. of the cultural heritage as well yes. I mean it's just a, a remarkable part of the world and can That's be very true. very proud to be the custodian of this share of the region's uh, cultural heritage so no no it's it's uh, truly uh, a, not only as I said before a privilege it's also very affirming to have the opportunity to be in Pakistan. Well, that's excellent. Uh, let's just take a small break. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back after the short break. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're sitting with the High Commissioner of Australia in Pakistan, Miss Margaret Adamson. Welcome back. And I just want to tell you it's an honor having you here. Thank and you. let's talk about Pakistani culture. What is your favorite aspect about Pakistani culture? Mm. Well, that's a very difficult question because there are so many marvelous features. Mm -hmm. uh, often people say it's the cuisine. And I would say uh, in that, that is probably my husband's very favorite. I mean, I, I really am uh, delighted by, the, um, by the, the subtlety and the diversity of the Pakistani cuisine. I guess my, my favorite really is, is the, uh, the incredible mango. Uh, that Aww. would have to be front and center my, my favorite uh, Pakistani food. Um, 
my husband, on the other hand, is is he is something of a uh, he is something. I mean, a very accomplished chef, actually, my husband. Oh my goodness! But he takes a great, great interest in in all uh, uh, areas of, of cuisine. For me, I would say uh, I mentioned earlier on, you know, uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, built and uh, and the so-called intangible. Um, and there, I would have to say, um, on the on the built level, um, I have just been privileged to see so many different uh, versions of the ancient architecture. Whether one is talking about the Gandhara, mm. you know, right through obviously to the extraordinary uh, mosques and uh, also the the fort. Uh, agriculture, uh, pardon me, architecture. Yeah. I'm speaking too much about <laughs> agriculture earlier. Uh, architecture, just um, uh, really mind blowing. And and I think that where one sees um, extraordinary sharing, you know, whether it is the the the, the blue tiles uh, and and of course the the different shapes of the uh, of the architecture. And I was talking actually to a gentleman uh, last night who um, actually is from Multan. Mm. Uh, and uh, he was uh, agreeing with me that the ancient architecture was very, very smart in terms of what was even then a very hot uh, environment. You go into some of those ancient buildings and they are not only extraordinarily beautiful and meaningful in terms of what they represent, but they are air conditioned because you know the, the air flows through the, the very high windows at the top. So these are favorites. And then it comes down to, of course, it comes down to uh, the textiles. Mm. It comes down to the, the carpets. It comes down uh, to the, and I'm, I'm learning, uh, but a very poor student <laughs> of, of Udu, but I know that the poetry is, uh, and of course the music, these are incredibly important elements uh, of, of, the, of the culture of, of Pakistan and, and all of its disparate peoples. I've, I've, uh, in the northern areas, for example, I went to a, a school where they were learning how to make the traditional musical instruments yeah. and then how to play these musical instruments. This is living, intangible cultural heritage, which is just so incredibly important that this be continued so that future generations will also be able to enjoy and, and take pride in uh, these, these remarkable origins. Speaking of future generations, um, as someone looking at Pakistan from a different perspective, mm. what, do you, what qualities do you think diplomats should incorporate in them? Um, you mean uh, international diplomats? International diplomats. Oh goodness. Um, well, look, I, I mentioned earlier curiosity. And I mean, that's a, that's <laughs> a feature of me personally. But I do think that it's um, it's incredibly important. If you're not curious, then you're not going to ask perhaps uh, as many questions as as might be uh, a useful thing to do. I mean, we all need as as diplomats uh, to strive. Um, I think uh, not only with enthusiasm, but also to be driven to strive you know to it's a need we to really need to work hard to understand uh, the environment in which we are operating because if you don't do that you're not going to be uh, an effective interlocutor uh, for your um, your your um, institutional country. partners within the country that you are in and so again it goes all the way back to those conversations about being an envoy centuries ago. Mm. You need to understand the local context, otherwise you're not going to connect. And then, in terms of the efficacy of your engagement, um, again, you need that in order to be effective. How are you going to um, f find or forge a consensus on particular issues if, if you don't have an understanding of where the other side is coming from? And if you are going to interpret for your nation uh, what is actually happening in a particular nation or in a particular region, well then again you need to understand not only the, the contemporary situation, the pressures, the challenges, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the positive developments that are underway in the contemporary uh, situation, but you must also have the historical context as well. So I think that all of that grows out of a curiosity, but it is also very much part, we, we often use the term the, the diplomatic toolkit uh, yeah. and, and you simply must have that, uh, that curiosity. I think you've also, you've got to have quite a bit of patience That's as true. well. Because there's, um, you know, when, when one is uh, dealing with national interests, um, I mean we, we of course have an election cycle and uh, it's often said, in, and uh, quite apart from the, the, uh, the duration of an election cycle, in Australia ours are actually quite short. Hmm. They're, they're, they're never more than three years and often much shorter. Right. So a government 
will not be in play unless it's re-elected for more than, say, three years in Australia. That's a short time frame. Yeah. But if you are going to seek a, an agreement to a long-standing uh, challenge or disagreement, so that might be a bilateral disagreement or it might be something like, you know, how to deal with uh, the, uh, the the phenomenon of climate change yeah. or uh, you know the the uh, very very difficult uh, long-standing health epidemics like for example polio and and, yeah. and other long-standing malaria etc these are things they're not going to be solved in three years yeah. and so a, a diplomat who's engaged in these kinds of issues the law of the sea convention the convention on uh, the elimination of all forms of discrimination mm. against women these take years and years and years and years years and years and years so uh, people who are engaged in these negotiations must have a very very uh, you know long breath so to speak <laughs> and be very very uh, patient and at the same time quite nimble. You need to understand when is a shift point yeah. so that you can then capitalize on that shift point to try to clinch uh, an agreement. All right. Uh, my last question mm. is, um, what opportunities do you think um, Australia provides Pakistan? I mean, it does provide Pakistan with such uh, wonderful opportunities, be it HEC or AusAid. Uh, what do you think, how do you think we can reciprocate these to Australian um, uh, societies uh, and educational institutions? Well, I think that's a very fine question. In our earlier conversation uh, with the, the body of students, um, I did note that uh, we, we, of course, on both sides are looking to develop our, our economic relationship to actually fulfill uh, its, its uh, much larger potential. Yeah. And so there I think that you know, one, one looks for opportunities whereby we're not simply talking about, um, as it were, help and support, but you're looking at areas of win-win, um, yeah. as it were, on, on a mutual interest level. And I do believe that, uh, that here we can see um, big opportunities, whether one is looking uh, in various sectors of, of uh, agricultural uh, or water or energy, um, all of those levels. But also it comes, I think, into the area of, of education yeah. and also, I would argue, into the area of the arts. And the arts links all the way back again uh, to cultural heritage yeah. as, as well. It's, a, it's really a, a, a vibrant and living thing. So I think that we, we have partnerships already in operation. These uh, can, can do uh, much, much more. They can be much more broadly based and they can be much deeper. And I think that um, we're, we're on a path in, in that respect and I'm delighted you know, to have that question posed because I think what it demonstrates is that uh, we have um, a generation coming through in Pakistan which is, is keen to play an active role, not only in this bilateral relationship yeah. in terms of being a partner, but in being an active participant in the global governance, yeah. in the global effort to, you know, to safeguard and uh, our planet and to have you know, win-win for all of us uh, all around the world. So I think that that's a wonderful question and uh, I would say in all of those respects uh, we will see coming into the future uh, more and more of those partnerships uh, getting underway. Well, that was an excellent answer and thank you so much for your time, Ms. Adamson. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. I would like to thank Her Excellency again, Miss Margaret Adamson, for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was an honor having you. And thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you next time. Allah